Hey everyone, Jordan here. Today we're going to be doing a bit of an experiment. I'm going to build a system around the AMD 9700X and at the end I'm also going to test it against the 9800X 3D to see if the extra price that you pay is beneficial to the FPS difference. Now if you're on a budget, the price gap between those two processors could make the difference between getting the GPU you want to use in the system or maybe settling for something cheaper. So hopefully it'll be a helpful video for those of you that are on the fence between these two processors. So I'm going to get straight into the video. I'll tell you about the parts as we go and let's get building. So of course our two CPUs, the AMD 9700X and 9800X 3D, these are kind of set up by Scan Computers UK. They're one of the biggest UK retailers selling a whole host of different components, pro audio, video gear, even some musical instruments. I'll leave their links down below. So the 9700X and 9800X 3D are both 8 core and 16 thread processors. The 9700X has got a 3.8 base with a 5.5 GHz turbo whereas the 9800X 3D has got a 4.7 base and 5.2 GHz turbo. But most importantly, the 96 megabytes are level free cache for our gaming. At the time of filming, Scan will be selling a motherboard and 9700X combo. If you do think the 9700 is the one for you, this is going to be cheaper than the 9800X 3D alone and also saves you £30 over buying the CPU and motherboard separately. Plus you also get free delivery, which is a nice bonus. Now for this testing, I'm going to be using the Asus Strix B850-F. The B850F is a pretty beefy board, but as I will be testing the 9800X 3D as well, that's why I've gone for this one. Would recommend a higher end board if you do choose that CPU at the end. So lifting up the lever and then we'll get the 9700X installed. Okay, got a bit of a wiggle. The top will pop off. And don't forget to keep that in case you need to do an RMA. For storage, we're going to use the Solidine P44 Pro. This is a one terabyte model a 7000 megabyte read and 6500 megabytes write. This is a nice quick release on this board as well, so easy to get at our M.2 slot. Just take off the pills the opposite way for this one. Then we've got a little quick release there. And then just do the pill on the back. The other side. And that just goes in and locks down. Really simple, love that. For memory, I'm going to be using some Corsair Vengeance RGB. This is a 32 gigabyte kit, two 16 gig sticks, 6,000 mega transfers per second CL36. I've used these sticks for a couple of builds now. I found them to be very reliable. So let's get those installed. There you go. Now let's get on to our AIO. So I'm going to be using the Corsair IQ Link Titan 360RX. This is the LCD model as well. So a little bit overkill for what we're going to be doing today but they have recently sent these over for some future reviews and I thought you might like to see a little sneak peek. So we just take off the standard brackets to install this area, install the AMD ones as we are using the rectangular mount rather than the standard Intel square one. There we go, so that's ready to mount. A little bit of a different mount as well, it's got all the screws pre-installed as well so you don't need to do any extra like standoffs or stuff which is going to be quite good. Now I'm going to do something a bit backwards, I'm going to actually clean off the thermal paste so I can use Noctua on both of the uh, tests where we run them because obviously we're using two different processors we don't want to use two different thermal pastes we want to keep things nice and consistent so but why Corsair thermal paste so I'll put that top on there because this can now just go straight into the roof as we have got pre-installed fans we do have some Alex and reverse Alex fans to use in other builds uh, but for this one I want to keep it simple as obviously we're just focusing primarily on the testing of the two processors so we've got the same setup in there then we're going to be using the Corsair Frame 4000 as well, so a little bit of a refresh over the 4000D. We've also got Reverse Connect compatibility on there as well if you're using a Reverse Connect motherboard. Corsair have also improved the cooling as well on this case, and it also uses their new InfiRail mounting system. This slides for different fan sizes, so you can have options up to 200mm in the front and 140mm in the top. So it's really nice to have a refresh of the original 4000D or 4000X. I had uh, my test system in this one for ages so i'm looking forward to checking out the new one nice bit of tempered glass and then we can see there our back support compatibility for the rear connect boards so we just bring our motherboard down in there we go found the middle i really love that they've got a center like a little pin as well on corsair cases so it's really easy to find where the motherboard needs to go in a strategic move, I'm going to put my EPS cables from my power supply into the motherboard now and then route them down the back of the case. I think it might be a little bit fiddly after we put the AIO in, so big fingers, not built for that, so I'll do that now. PSU we're going to be using is the Corsair RM1000X. This is a fully modular power supply. Also, the newer units are Cybernetics Gold certified. They also have zero RPM fan modes and a 10-year warranty. 
I've used this power supply quite a lot. I actually really like this one. It's probably one of my favorites, especially with the long warranty that it's got. Now I've got all my cables out. I've also got an additional PCIe because we're going to be using our Corsair IQ, which runs off one of those. I've also got enough so we don't have to use the pigtails either. So we can use the cables directly. Might see if we can tuck those underneath afterwards, tidy it up a little bit. So we've got enough there for the graphics card and IQ. So we get all these connected into the end now and then we can get that installed. So now I'm just going to run my 8-pin EPS cables up to the top of the case, up through this gap here, and get those plugged in. So I've installed the EPS cables now on the top of the case. I just need to adjust the infi rail system. So we'll just undo that at the top and at the back and then slide that across to the 120 option. Also gives us a bit more space at the back there as well. Just slide this down so you can see where our EPS cables come through. So it's gonna have a nice lot of clearance. I always do worry about the EPS cables getting a bit squished in compact cases, but this one's gonna have a nice lot of space. Now, just a word of warning, if you are gonna be using this cooler, there are radiator fins under the screw holes. So make sure you use the washers, otherwise the screws will go too far and possibly puncture one of the fins. I will be taking marks off Corsair for that. I do like to see a blank space underneath usually. This is the new Corsair iLink if you haven't seen it before. This is a much smaller design. You can literally power all of the fans off a couple of cables as you are using the PCI rather than like the typical Molex or SATA that they used to use. It's far more intuitive than it used to be as well. And uh, I'm glad to see that they changed it. It is a bit more expensive, of course, um, but I think it's certainly worth it, especially when you're using multiple components. On this case, there is also a little point for it on the back, so it can sit perfectly in the back there of course you can stick it wherever you want it is magnetic i may put it a bit further down but uh, there's a nice little spot there for it if you're also using iLink. okay i've got the iq hub now connected to a usb 2 port that just then goes straight into there and you need to power it as well and i'm going to take this cable into the bottom of the fans at the front of the case and then come from the top into the hub so it's just basically one cable that connects everything together really simple like i said it is more expensive but certainly worth it especially if you're a beginner so I'm going to install the Alex fans in the front, like I mentioned earlier. These have got a little connectors. You just put those together. And there's also ones that bridge the connections. They've also got magnets as well. So they only go on one way. And these just literally connect together like that. And then we'll do a rinse and repeat for the top part. So we've got the little spacer and then the data bridger. And just install those in the front, add the cable onto the IQ hub, and then we can get our graphics card in. So for this one, we're going to be using the Asus Prime RX 9070 XT. I have got a full review on the channel if you want to check it out in a bit more detail. It's got 3030 megahertz boost and a 2490 megahertz game clock in the OC mode, 16 gigabytes of GDR6 memory. Also has Axle Tech fans and uses phase change pads, which is something I find pretty cool. So the card's ready to go in. I now have all of the cables all over the place though. That's the problem with not wanting to use the pigtails. It does create a lot of extra cable. I have got the one going back to the IQ hub. Now, obviously the main reason for this video is to compare the two processes, but if I was running this full term, I'd certainly get some eight pin PCI extensions so we don't have all the extra cables, but it will do for now. I'll tidy it up as much as I can afterwards. But for now, let's get this installed. Let's get these cables out of the way and our hoses. I've taken out the two brackets. So the second and third in this case, there we go. I found out to take off the covers for the display outputs on the back. It was kind of getting it a little bit stuck. So let's get that screwed back in with our thumb screws. Now just time for our <laughs> mess of cables to be connected up. But I shall do all this, get everything else connected, and I can show you it all finished. So I've now tested both of these processes. It's been a pretty long day, but I've now got all the scores for you and the results. The only thing that I've changed about the system other than the default settings, I have enabled XMP and then also set the fans to 1600 RPM in IQ. That just helped with our thermal testing as well, which I've also got some information for. So I'll start to roll through these. I've also done some normal benchmarks. So we've got 3D Mark Time Spy and Steel Nomad. Cinebench and Geekbench 5. These are free to download if you want to test and compare to your own system at home. As expected, we did see a little bit of a boost on the multi-core scores with Cinebench with the 9800X3D, but the 9700X has got a little bit of a higher single core score, but overall, obviously you are paying more for the X3D and we have seen overall higher scores with those tests. And moving on to gaming, starting with Apex Legends, pretty much identical results for both CPUs. You could get that result with each of those just between runs, so really nothing notable there. Corosis, we did see a low 1% dip using the 9800X 3D, which is a bit surprising. However, we are using a new graphics card, so that could be just something that's fixed with the driver update. We do see that all the time launch cards having poor low FPS, so that just could be this occasion. 
Moving on to Dirt 5, this is one of the bigger jumps that we've seen, so an extra 10 FPS on the X3D over the 9700X. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was another title where we saw a pretty hefty jump, another 40 FPS, and also an improvement with the 1% lows as well. In Starfield, pretty much the same results for the average, but we did get an improvement on the 1% low with the X3D. Far Cry 6 was another nice jump with about a 33 FPS difference, also a nice improvement to the 1% lows as well. This is a title that we generally see favouring AMD anyway. And then Cyberpunk in 1440p high, a nice improvement to the 1% low. Then for a bit of a change, in Ray Tracing we actually see a better 1% low on the 9700X. In terms of temperatures, we saw a 20 degree delta difference, but we are looking at the 9700X with its 65 watts to the 130 the X3D, so obviously we're going to see a considerable jump in temperatures there. And the eagle wide amongst you may notice that I've got the 9700X back in here at the moment. I went and tested the wattage from the wall. Thought it might be quite a useful metric for you guys as well. We saw a high of the X3D of 493 and then the 9700X came in with a 481. So very close there again. So even though the TDP of the 9800X3D is almost twice the 9700X, doesn't seem to make that much difference when you're actually using it. So a little bit of a mixed bag with this one. I was expecting further results, like further apart, but as you saw, some of the titles were minute differences. For example, you could see that difference between runs on the same processor, at one or two FPS. Then we did see some bigger jumps like Dirt 5 and uh, Far Cry, for example, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Those were the ones that we did see the biggest jumps on. There are a couple of other minute details. For example, the 9700X can take more RAM, 256 gig over a measly 192 on the X3D. Um, but generally speaking, you are paying 52% extra for the X3D to get those improvements on the 1% low. So it's obviously down to if you've got that in the budget. Obviously, a lot of people would be like, well, I want that and I want the 1% lows. I'm using this monitor, for example. I'm going to splash the cash and just, you know, sod it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter to me. But like I said in the intro, it could make the difference in that price between getting the card you want, a brand new one like this, the 9070 XT, or having to settle for something cheaper. Now, if you're wondering about 4K, you could expect console-like frame rates with this graphics card. Obviously, it depends on what you're using, but I did give the raw performance because obviously then you can use FSR and improve upon it. But generally speaking, all the titles we tested, the 9700X has done a really great job. It just depends if you want to spend that extra little bit to have the higher 1% lows. So I think I'm going to leave it there for this one. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Get subscribed and ding the bell if you did. I have got, like I said, the Frame 4000 review coming and also the cooler. I've got loads of other build content coming. There's a lot in the works and uh, lots to look forward to. So please get subscribed if you haven't already. Any other questions you've got, leave them down below and I'll get back to you. I'll leave the links in the description box for these things as well. A big thank you to Scan for sending out the processes you've seen featured in this video. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.